if you had to sum up sort of like some of the main ideas in the Slab Boys, the main themes that you as a writer you probably don't think in terms of that telling a story. Yeah. What were some of the ideas that really excited you that you wanted to just get down and explore? Yeah, well, it was written in the form of uh, a dark, darkish comedy. But you don't know it's dark until you have seen it all and come out of the theatre and then go, oh my God, I was laughing at that. <laughs> really been, you know, I heard as many people, especially women, uh, saying how, oh God, I'm, I'm, I'm so embarrassed and I was laughing at that. And it was uh, actually very tragic. But that's exactly how I want to catch people. I want to catch people uh, in the theatre laughing and crying at the same time. It's you know, and the laughter yeah. dominates, really, and it's only after you come out you get the, the full force of it, because it's, uh, the plot, the narrative plot is concealed under the dialogue, mm -hmm. and every bit of, uh, every clue, there's clues in all the dialogue, buried in it, and it's only when you come out the, the, the spring to mind you remember them all. And, uh, as it sort of unravels and as we get towards the end and we yeah, find out what well, really know, does happen. And you realise yeah. you've been watching a, a story, a, a total narrative and a plot. I mean, I remember in the third programme on the radio uh, all those years back and they were, uh, they said, oh, he's, he's, he can do characters and he can do dialogue, but where's the, where's the plot? And they're talking about soap opera where it's all plot, as we all know. So I uh, was careful to conceal it and bury it in uh, That's really just interesting. apparently inconsequential conversations. That is really, really interesting. It's all because it feels just like life to an extent. Yeah. And to I mean, the banter is. that you might have. Yeah. And, but uh -huh. it all up sort of unravels and uh -huh. sort of speeds up and intensifies yes. as you get to the and end. It gets like a train. The end because there are uh, events in the, the play which have, uh, don't seem to have anything to do with uh, Phil's life and this Phil's life we follow right from the start yes. to the end when he arrives late yes. and his mother has been taken away to the, lo the loony bin as he calls it, uh, which it was, which we all called it as well. Uh, so that was uh, 18 drafts, full drafts of that play before it went on stage and it was a finished play. Uh -huh when I got there and there was no ad libs, there was no nobody changing lines or anything. I had mean, I done all the work beforehand and that's very important. And the, the script as as it as it is at the moment, is that the same script as That's the same script as nineteen seventy eight. Wow. When we did it. That's because there's nothing more to add or take away. And it's incredible that it feels such like obviously natural repartee, natural. Well, that's what it's chat. meant to mean. Of course. And it's actually baroque uh, dialogue. It's a construction. Uh, I, I I love uh, dialogue and speech. I have. You'll never hear anything uh, in real life that's pinched at all. You know, apart from the way people articulate and and. Uh, uh, pronounced words, and it's mostly street talk uh, from my own life and uh, being brought up in Thurgersley Park, and then I added a Baroque twist to it all. A Baroque a, twist? A Baroque. A Baroque. A Baroque. 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 B-A-R-O-Q-U-E. Tell us a bit more about that. That's it's decorated. It's yeah. decorated. It's like a restoration play. It's like, it really is, it does go back to that construction uh, of Sheridan and all these people who uh, wrote a theatrical language and it's not real speech, it's theatrical. In what way? Uh, in the construction, it's very carefully constructed uh, and there's a, and my, my dialogue is comical for the most part and there's only uh, it was the same in Tutti Frutti, when the only sincere and straightforward words that uh, Danny McGlone ever said was, I, I love you. 
and they didn't say it right because I wasn't there, I was at home writing the book. And uh, Susie comes back in and she says, what was that? She says, and he spelled it out with I love you, which wasn't it, it sounded insincere, and they should have said it sincerely, I love you. Can I ask you a question about Phil? And yes. it's fair, where do you think in the play Phil speaks most from his heart in the way that Danny did? Oh, God. I think at the very, very end when he, he says, oh, God, I've just remembered Giotto was a slab boy. And he, and he, when he does a cartwheel, yeah. it echoes his tale of the, the young woman who came into the convalescent home when he was 11. Yes. And that actually happened in my life. Uh -huh. uh, I was at the convalescent home with my mother in West Bright, and we were all sitting catatonic, you know, and this young girl, beautifully dressed, came in and turned up, <laughs> ran right into the room and turned the cartwheel and then lifted her arms in the air and everybody hated her. It's true. They were you all, loved it. <laughs> I loved it and it stayed with me. And uh, that's when he is totally, uh, that's his, he speaks of his ambition there. And so his, his goal, his target, and, yeah. he, and he, it turns out he makes it. He does make it because that's me in the play. And although, I mean, he, does, he doesn't get into no, the school of art. No, because he has to be knocked back. He has to. Uh, that was a, a portent of every hurdle he has to uh, uh, yeah. be Because he's got so many obstacles, and that's interesting because that the, the tone of the ending, uh, it seemed like it was a real downward spiral for Phil, but actually yeah. there's that wee lift then. Yeah, because yeah. he's got the spirit inside himself yeah. to make it, and he doesn't need any help. And the, and the more obstacles in this way, the harder he'll work, and the harder he'll try. Really interesting. And you, you get lucky breaks, but you, my father, uh, who was a very, very simple person and a wonderful man, and he said, you make your own luck. You do make your own luck because you have to work for it. You have to work to make your luck. So that's a... Uh, it's interesting because Phil, of course, is someone who looks like he doesn't do any work, but he obviously there's things... No, he didn't really do any work that he didn't <laughs> want to do. But he goes home and he draws and he draws and he draws and he walks and he walks and he walks. When I come home from this, I'm working till midnight, uh, doing my work, my other work, you know, it's, my new work. It's like a need in him, isn't it, I guess? Yeah. But it's dead interesting how, of course, he does not tell Spanky that he's gone to the Glasgow School of Art to try and get in. He keeps no. that quite secret. What? No, he has to keep that secret because he doesn't know himself. What will happen? No, he has no idea. He's, he's confident in one way that he's good enough. He, he knows he's good enough to get in, but when he doesn't get in, no, he doesn't, he doesn't reveal everything. He covers mm -hmm. everything up. He's a very secretive person. Yeah. And he covers it up with badinage and uh, humour. Yeah. Even, even when he's describing uh, to... When, he, when the conversation between Curry and uh, when Curry discovers from the Paisley Express uh, various apartment women in, in the window, in the store window accident. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, when, he's, when Curry says, No, a scratch, it must have been a miracle. No, a Ford prefect. He'll make a joke of that as well. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And, uh, and why does he does, why does he use humour in such cruel situations? It's the best. It's the funniest humour you'll ever get. It's always true. It's true to life, and the crueler it is, the funnier it is. It is, but but what well, it is for us certainly the yeah, audience. And I'm do you think it, is it does it help him cope with? Yes, I, I presume it does help him cope with life. And yeah. uh, he comes from a very very poor uh, background, and his poor mother has been like that all his life, all his remembered life, and will go on like that until she dies. And she dies in the lunatic asylum as well. Very sad. Tell me a bit about his relationship with Spanky and what they both get out of this brilliant double act they have. Well, it, it makes a time uh, fly, and, <laughs> and the danger is that they'll both be, oh, either one or the other will be sacked. <laughs> <laughs> and Phil is beyond caring at this point, you know, <clears throat> and he almost forces Curry to sack him 
And Cuddy says, I even ask for a second chance for you, mm -hmm. you for me, uh, me for you rather. And, uh, but he just, he, he sort of uh, maneuvers himself into the position where he won't be sacked. He doesn't want to be a designer, he wants to be an artist. What do you think, what's he going to do when he gets the sack? This is, I mean, this is outside the actual stories we're looking at it on the page, but yeah. what's going to happen to him? What's he going to do with himself? I have no idea, <laughs> except <laughs> when it comes to the, the middle play, yeah. uh, Cut in a Rug, and then the final play, we get to the truth of all that, you know, that uh, Spanky comes back as a pop star, um, a, a, a rock and roll guy. Uh, out in the big tour and he's sort of showing off swanking and uh, uh, Phil hasn't quite succeeded in uh, selling any paintings or whatever, you know, and I, I suppose you'll, uh, the people listening and watching this will uh, discover as they read uh, into the, the, the second, the middle play is, is about the time since after that mm -hmm. very same night yeah. and then there's a a ten year gap, gap before still life and then a further five years at the interval. So it covers fifteen years and we discover so many things have happened. But even yeah. if he's not necessarily selling his art, he's still an artist. And he know, considers himself an artist, an artist now, yeah. doesn't he? He's an artist now. He is. You don't have yeah. to sell it to be an artist. No. He's an artist in his soul. And he knows yes. that I guess. Yes, end, he, he, he is. It's like uh, it's going to be a long time before mm. he you know, I actually had to uh, make use of subterfuge in order to get a show in London the first time around, 1967, and pretending to be my father. And uh, I got a show. Uh, uh, I An art remember. show? Yeah. Uh -huh. Just off Bond Street in London and was petted <laughs> <laughs> by a subterfuge. So you pretended to be somebody else, your yes. father, and you yes. got a show that was hugely successful. Yeah, it was. It's so do you, do you think you need to be a bit, you need to duck and dive and be a little bit wide? Well, if you've thing? tried everything else, <laughs> and I used to go around the galleries in London constantly, uh, in those days, in the uh, 1960s, early 70s, uh, all the, there were 27 galleries in Cork Street, it was a very short street, mm. and uh, that was where the whole yeah. art, uh, uh, Galleries were, were centred in Cork Street, and now it's mostly Bond Street. And do you see Phil doing something like that as well? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about, I mean, it was written a while ago, it was set in 1957. Yeah. Here we are. I, I started it in 1975 or 76, <laughs> so it was uh, almost 20 years after the, uh, the play is set. And so uh, what what makes it so relevant to a young audience of Phil's age now? Because it's about people, and people never change. People are constantly from the... If you watch Wolf Hall, uh -huh. you see that, that as well mm -hmm. in the 16th century. Yeah. And people, people's nature, ambitions, uh, whatever, and love never alters, and uh, problems never alter. Desire for change and getting away from where yeah, you're situated no, and we're all No, it's just, it's just life as human beings, you know, that's what comes through in the play. I think 36 years, 37 years after we first did it, and it's just because there are people like us, the audience, who are watching it. And um, the audience, I mean, I've, I've seen the set model box, you know, I'm interested, is that a similar kind of set to the original? Yeah, it's very similar because you can only have one door in and out of the. That's right. It's a, it's a, a, a cordoned off area in which they are uh, kings until somebody else comes in. You know, somebody in, in the authority comes in and then they're reduced to prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> because everyone's a prisoner in like the slab room, is that? No, I mean, uh, there's Hector who gets his job at the end. Uh, That's true. Yeah, and Spanky goes on. Uh, for quite some time, and then he gets into music. It, 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 it takes him quite a while, but uh, I don't oh. know what happens to Phil, really. Are there any little bits, any little bits of the design that the audience 
will maybe want to look out for or will kind of work on the audience as the time they're looking at it and think, oh, now I understand that bit. That will sort of help the story along. Yeah, everyone now is to the, the point of illuminating. A designer's job is to illuminate the text and not to, and, and actually to play second fiddle. There's lots of designers I've worked with who don't realise that. And I've designed plays for other uh, playwrights as well. And there's only a chance they would get to meet another writer because you don't meet them. They're busy working away in the room. So I decided to sit, put myself forward for uh, designing other people's plays as well. And so what, telling, sort of illuminating the story, illuminating the text, how does this, I mean, I mean obviously this is set in a slab room and so this is what we're seeing. Yeah. You know, and we've talked a bit about being being trapped but also being able to get out, so there's those two doors. Yeah. Which there's, allow a lot well, of comedy. There's, there's just one door in and out of the slab room. Oh, there's not, there's not two? Oh, no, right, no, there's just one two. in and out, so you can't escape from it without somebody, you have to. The course has to be clear before you can of course. go down to the, the lobbies for a smoke. Right, 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 right. Like down a down classroom to... in lots yeah, of ways. Actually. Yeah, I, you're hemmed in, there's nowhere else to go. Yeah, quite claustrophobic. Yeah. And does the, does the, does the set feel like that? Will it feel like that for the actors? Well, it feels like that when you're on the set. Yeah. It looks slightly bigger than, the, than the, uh, when you're watching from the audience, but they're. It's not a very big space, and got, they work in these slabs which are on wooden cabinets, and there's, it's actually full of rubbish as well. Great. And, uh, <laughs> so there's no, nowhere else, to, there's not a lot of room to manoeuvre. Uh, tell me a bit about what they're going to be wearing. I've seen, I mean, I've seen these designs that yeah, they're working well, with up in wardrobe. They're wearing their own, their own outdoor clothes, under the, but each one of them has a dust coat. Right. And has decorated that dust coat, you know, with yeah. paint and stuff and painted yeah. their names in the back totally, of it. Totally, yeah. A bit of graffiti, you know, their own. Yeah. They will adorn anything that they wear. And they have to be, they have to look. That's why uh, Alan the new boy is such a contrast to them. He's, he wears his university blazer. It's quite his, clean. His pressed flannels and his brogues and his <laughs> shirt and tie, his university tie. And uh, there's such a contrast to them. So they're, they're drawing and writing and doing their own kind of mentions on all their clothes. What is that just so they feel that they own them really? And yeah. A bit of personality. Ah, it's to identify themselves, you know. Yeah. As somebody. It's, it's the same where prisoners get tattoos and stuff like that. Yeah. And people get tattoos who are only prisoners as well. To say, this is me. You when know. you're bored, you'll just do anything really, won't you? Ah, you will. Entertain yourself. And quite a lot of it is them entertaining themselves. Entertainment <laughs> makes the day go and life go. Uh, faster and uh, much more lively, yeah. Um, do you think that, I know this is, do you think that a, a Glasgow audience, a West Coast audience, are going to get the humour and get these characters, get the whole thing, maybe more than another audience? And I know this... Well, well since I come from the, the West Coast, from Paisley actually, which is even a bit different from Glasgow, but the Glass Regions will get it. Immediately, they'll know that he asked what something means. But there was a. Uh, uh, what was his name? Bernard Levin. Bernard Levin, who was a critic on the Sunday Times, I think, came up to see it at the Traverse. And uh, this is Davy Heyman, who's directing it. I directed the first one, uh, and directing it now, 36 years later, was reminding me that uh, Bernard Levin said in his column. If you have to crawl on your hands and knees and beg for a ticket up the stairs of the tiny theatre space in the Royal Court in Sloan Square, do so. And he says, don't worry about the language. You absorb it by osmosis. Don't worry about that at all. And you get the whole thing. And if you let yourself be free and don't say, oh, I don't understand this. Yeah. And it was a huge hit. I'm sure it's going to be a huge hit here as well. No, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Louise. I want to ask you one last question. We know the answer to it, right? I, was, I've, I also, this is what a pupil had said to ask this, and I asked it of David uh -huh. as well. Are you Phil? Are, are you Spanky? Or are you Hector? Now, I, we sort of know. I, <laughs> I am all of those people. I am all three different facets of myself. 
And yeah. did you feel like that when you were writing it as well? Yeah, I knew that because I knew, I know I'm writing a, a character, I get their names first because I have to get the right name first. I do a drawing of them and then that's them alive. But they've got the right name and I can picture them. Yeah. And uh, I live all their lives through their dialogue. I'm all of those, including uh, Lucille. Yeah. Yeah, everybody. And Curry. Maybe that's a writer's job. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it is to make people come alive on stage and it's the actor's job to inhabit those uh, living creatures from the page. They should already be living alive on the page. And then it's, uh, it's a matter of grinding. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's us, John. Thank you so much Not for your time you. today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>